Well, you know what Worship Wednesday is about. It's the day that we put the spotlight on Jesus. We want to tell the story of what Jesus has been doing in and through his church, how he's been at work in the lives of his people, as a, as a means of encouragement to each one of us to know that God is alive and well and he is working and he's helping us to come to a, a greater understanding of who he is and what he actually accomplished for us at Calvary so that we can rest in his finished work and experience what it means to come to him and experience the rest that he promised when he said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What does that even mean? What does that look like? Well, we're going to talk about that kind of thing today with Kathleen Kaczmarek, and I hope I'm saying that name right. She's author of a book called The Law of Redemption, What Must One Do to Go to Heaven? Well, we'll dig in, but we're also going to hear Kathleen's story in the process. And Kathleen, welcome to NBL. Did I, did I say your name right, Kaczmarek? Yes, you, you said it right. We, we typically we say Kazmarek, and actually it's not even the Polish way of saying it. But we, uh, and it's my married name too. So, but uh, we personally, as a family, we say Kazmarek. But that you said it really well, actually. Okay. All right. Well, I've got a little bit of Polish blood in me, so I got to okay, work. I got to well, get it go. right. For I got to get it right <laughs> for the motherland. Okay. Anyway, um, wow. So thank you for joining us. Yours is an interesting story because it's not just the book we're going to talk about. It's what God has literally done in your life as well. But yeah. let me just kind of throw it out to you for a second. Let's pretend we're sitting on a city bus and I don't know you and I happen to sit down next to you because it's the only seat available. And, and somehow I, I recognize that you're writing or whatever. I say, what are you doing? And I say, I'm working on my book. And I say, well, what's, what's it about? What's what's this book about how do you describe that in short fashion like for somebody who hasn't heard before that you're an author what what did you decide to write about in this book yes yeah, so I, I wrote about this book it's about love versus grace so I really in this book and it's really a teaching on yeah love versus grace legalism versus the grace of God and it's really based on of course scriptures and on what I went through because the thing is um, I, I was born again actually when I was 25 years of age and, and and really like on fire for God and I love God, but over a period of time, very subtly, I ended up switching my allegiance from Christ to the law. And, and that's something that's very subtle and deceptive. So the, the purpose of the book is really to expose legalism because while some devoted Christians would never think of backsliding in sin, mm-hmm. unknowing to them, some of them, and that's the purpose of this whole thing, have backslidden something even more subtle, which is legalism, which actually strengthens sin. <laughs> and so it, it, it's, just a, 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 it's just the purpose is to expose that, that uh, legalism for what it is and the danger of it and to draw and lead people back to the grace of God, to Christ. You know, we've, we've had a number of conversations about similar things over the years, uh, some of them with Andrew Farley, who hosts the Grace Message, but he sometimes says that, you know, flirting with the law is like cheating on Jesus, and you literally have a a section in here about spiritual adultery, but help us understand what that looks like, because there really is something to that. You said that you became a believer, and you were trusting Jesus, but then began to somehow get involved more with the law than the grace that Christ had provided. Indeed, and that's interesting because actually the Lord in His goodness, because you know the Bible says that He's the he, He's our bridegroom, and even the Bible says that God is our husband, mm-hmm. and so the Lord, the Bible says that the Lord is a jealous God, and, and and so actually because of that, and you know while some people are not sure that they like the thought that God is jealous, is jealous, is jealous love is what really began to convince me that He loved me because. We really mean something to him. Like, it really matters to him when we start to, for example, like you said, flirt with the law, for example. And so, yes, so for me, for example, on my journey, just uh, the Lord started to actually, he started to show me that something wasn't right. And so, actually, he started to, I started to have recurring dreams. And so, you know, they would happen once in a while at first, and then the frequency of the dreams started to increase until... I had them almost every night, at least weekly, and almost every night when I could sleep. And the dreams were kind of, either I was going back to my old boyfriends, or because, you know, before I was a Christian, I had many boyfriends, and so God, praise the Lord, He saved me from my past life. And so I had many boyfriends, and then, um, or I would have uh, dreams where I had a sexual relationship with other men, and that really troubled me, because I'm married. 
And the thing is, I had no desire or no thought of, you know, doing anything like that. And yet I would have those dreams that kept coming. And so by the time when the Lord revealed to me that legalism was my problem, he showed me what that meant in terms of spiritual adultery. And actually, if you allow me, I'm just going to read a few verses from Romans chapter 7, because sure. this really, really highlights this very well. And so it's verses 1 to 6, and I'm going to read from the Amplified Classic Edition version, and that's going to really just kind of help us fully see from Scripture that indeed it's spiritual adultery when we when we submit to the law and place our trust in the law, and it can be any law. We can submit to any law. Anything can become a law to us. It doesn't have to be the law of Moses. I mean, it can be. It can be any law that we start to submit to as a means of righteousness, no longer resting in a finished work of the cross to empower us to live the life. So let me just read the, the verses. Sure. So from 1 to 6. So it says, Do you not know, brethren, for I am speaking to men who are acquainted with the law, that legal claims have power over a person only for as long as he is alive. For instance, a married woman is bound by law to her husband as long as he lives, but if her husband dies, she is loose and discharged from the law concerning her husband. Accordingly, she will be held an adulteress if she unites herself to another man while her husband lives. But if her husband dies, the marriage law no longer is binding on her. She is free from that law, and she... Uh, if she unites herself to another man, she's not an adulteress. Now, likewise, my brethren, you have undergone death as to the law through the crucified body of Christ, so that now you may belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. Now, here, when we were living in the flesh, mere physical life, and you know, by the way, when we undo the law, really we live a fleshly life, because they're all in our own strength that we try to live by the law. Mm -hmm. So, so when we were living in the flesh, mere physical life, the sinful passions that were awakened and aroused up by what the law makes sin were constantly operating in our natural powers, in our bodily organs, in the sensitive appetites and wills of the flesh, so that we bore fruit for death, and here it is. But now we have, now we are discharged from the law and have terminated all intercourse with it. Isn't that so plain? That's in the wow. Amplified. Yeah. Having died to what once restrained and held us captive, so now we serve not under the obedience to the old code of written regulations, but under the obedience of the promptings of the spirit of newness of life. And so here we have it plain and clear. And you know, by the way, when God gives us dreams, because God will speak in dreams, his dreams always are backed up with the word of God. And so there will be, you know, many times he speaks in symbolism. So in those dreams I mentioned, you know, they may seem very raw, but God, you know what, he doesn't go around, he doesn't beat around the bush when he speaks to us. And he's very clear and does not mince his words. He's really straightforward. And he was just basically telling me, I'm having intercourse with the law. <laughs> you know, he was just telling me, plain and simple, okay, you are, you're in spiritual adultery here and you need to come back. Yeah. yeah. Okay, now, but let's, and th that is so powerful, that's straight out of God's word. Anybody could, you know, get upset with you for using that kind of imagery, but you're just quoting scripture. You're just actually yes. talking about what God's word says. All right, Indeed. but now in, in practical terms, what does that really look like? In, in your own life, you said that you had fallen in love with Christ, you, you had placed your faith and trust in Him because of the grace He provided to you, but then you began to flirt with the law again. So, like how? How did you begin to flirt with the law? What's that look like? Yeah, so, you know, I would say that, you know, for, especially when you're so zealous for the Lord and you love the Lord so much, one of the ways that the enemy may try to kind of trick you is when you see somebody so hungry for God and so hungry for righteousness, you want to you wanna understand, again, like what that, that hunger stems from the finish work of the cross. And so it, it's an empowerment, and the Bible says that God works in us both to will and to do with good pleasure. We receive a new nature, uh, you know, that we are bent toward God and godliness, you know, when we receive that new nature. So that's the way I started. And, and so, but over a period of time, you know, I, and I love God, so I wanted to become like Jesus Christ, and I just kept, you know, like, a, I just wanted to become more like Him, and that's beautiful, and that's the way it should be. I mean, you know, like, we want to grow from glory to glory, mm -hmm. we want to perfect holiness and the fear of the Lord. Over a period of time, what is starting to happen is that my desire to become like Him, suddenly, I began to... And that's where now it shifted, you know, and the enemy would throw those little, you know, like, uh, lies. I began to experience that under condemnation as opposed to being motivated by love for God and just understanding that I'm all, I've been made right with God, and now 
you know, I'm righteous, and so now from glory to glory is changing me. Suddenly, over a period of time, this shifted more toward being motivated to become like him out of guilt and condemnation. We really have to be careful with guilt and condemnation because that, you know, the, the Bible says don't give a foothold to the enemy, and, and, and we cannot flirt, actually, with guilt and condemnation. You know, the Bible says that when we sin, if we confess our sins to God, is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so when we start to, to it, 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 you know, it's, it's just placing our faith in the blood of Christ, and that's all that is acceptable in God's sight. That's all that God will accept, no matter what you do, even when you are a child of God, if you mess up, the only payment for that mess up, for that sin, for the, you know, is the blood. There's nothing else that will be accepted. But for me, over a period of time, I begin to, I, I begin to feel condemned when I would miss, miss the mark, and I begin, and that's because I begin to subtly, slowly begin to live according to Christian standards or expectations, or I should be more loving. But now it began, it began twisted with suddenly I didn't want to be more loving just because God loved me first and because, you know, I want to represent him well because I love him, because I love righteousness. Over a period of time, suddenly, I need to be more loving so that God will not be displeased with me, so that I will not be condemned, so that I started to want to be loving because I didn't want to feel guilty. Now you see how it becomes twisted, mm -hmm. and that's all about me suddenly. Suddenly yeah. now, yes. So, the, but the grace of God purifies our motives so that we are free to serve Him out of love. But that can only happen out of the finished work of the cross. And so that shifting happened over a period of time where I, on the outside, I still looked very godly. I still looked the part. Because on the outside, nobody would see that throughout the period of time, what's, what's happening inside is my faith suddenly shifted from gradually, very subtly, because religion is very subtle and very yeah. deceptive. From my faith being in the finished work of the cross and being empowered by such finished work and by the grace of God, to suddenly, by the end of that whole journey, I was back at trying to literally earn my salvation and my own strength. I had all those things that the record of the pain in my mind, oh, I must not be jealous, I must not be proud, I must represent him perfectly. All of this stemming from fear that if I would miss the mark, I would end up in hell as a result. It, see how right. I started loving God. I was on fire for Him. I mean, I'm talking. I mean, I, I loved Him. I just, I loved His ways. I loved His word. I lo to, by the end of this whole journey, because unknowingly I gave the devil a foothold because I didn't know these things as much as perhaps, you know, I needed to know. Right. And so now by the end of the day, I was back at, okay, I must not do this. If I do this, I'm in. If I don't do that, I'm out. And the danger with that, too, is, you know what the Bible says, unless you obey the law perfectly at all times, you know, you are a transgressor. And so how could I know if I had ever done enough? How could I know when I had met the mark? And the thing is, every day, all of my weaknesses, my, the, the sin was a threat for me. Every day I feared hell, because now my salvation depended simply on my own ability to obey all of those whatever laws now that I have placed upon myself. Now, the law is good. There's nothing wrong with thou must not, you know, be proud. The law in itself is good. But if you're trying to submit to that law in your own strength, no longer relying on the finish of the cross, believing right. and knowing that you are right with God through his word, then now this is where the whole struggle begins. And the law, the Bible says, is the strength of sin. You have no way out there. Unreal. All right, yeah. so a lot more to talk about along those lines and well let's take a break and when we come back we'll do that kathleen kesmerick is author of the book the law of redemption it's subtitled what must one do to go to heaven and we'll talk about the book specifically but in general um kind of cover the issue of the law versus grace and how if we're failing to trust the finished work of christ in our life it will manifest itself in terms of us trying to do more for god work harder feel like it, th that we're not doing enough in our own strength we begin to feel a sense of condemnation and those are warning signs that we're not really trusting the finished work of christ we're trusting our own behavior which can't save us in the first place and it definitely can't perfect us so there's a lot more to talk about and i hope you'll stick around kathleen kasmerick our guest more of nbl coming up in just a moment right after this from aaron dodge all right, let's get back to it. Kathleen Kesmerick is author of the book called The Law of Redemption. It's a book that she wrote 
based on her own story, but most importantly on the story of Jesus at work in the lives of believers and what grace is really all about, what Jesus accomplished for us. And Romans, I believe it's chapter 10, you might know for sure, Kathleen, because I'm having a brain freeze, but it says that Christ is the end of the law for all who believe that something fundamentally changed when Jesus died and shed his blood. And I believe what happened was God ushered in a new covenant. Previously, the way to find, you know, uh, honor and love and, and, uh, and righteousness was to keep the law. And nobody was able to do that. So Jesus stepped in and did it for us. And it's by grace we're saved through faith. It is not of ourselves. It's not a result of our works so that none of us can boast. I think for some reason, Kathleen, people get the impression early on, or, or they, they're somehow able to comprehend that we can't save ourselves. Maybe it's just because we know what utter failures we are at trying to honor God with our lives, and we know that we've sinned. We know that we've fallen short. So we come to faith in Christ like you did, like I did, but then immediately somehow attach ourselves to a system that says, well, if you're going to perfect yourself and if you're going to really honor God with your life, then you're going to have to do more. You're going to have to try harder. You're going to have to live perfectly. And, and all of a sudden, adopt legalism and the law as our perfecter. Jesus might be our Savior, but somehow the law is going to perfect us. Scripture has a lot to say about that, and obviously that's a mistake you made as well as me early in my life. So uh, help, us how you came, help us understand how you came to the realization that uh, you knew something was wrong at some point, yeah. but how this began to turn around for you. So, so that's right. So I knew something was wrong because the thing is, by the time I really hit rock bottom, uh, I, well, like, I, you know, I think I said earlier, I could barely sleep. And I was really under anxiety and panic attacks all the time. So really there was no more joy in my salvation. So I, I it was just, and so again, it was a guilt and condemnation and, and no joy in my salvation. So the day came um, and I was driving um, from work to home when that happened. So the day came when I finally, by the grace of God, I cried out to him. Like, everything in me cried out to him. Because the thing, too, I was concerned, you know, well, not only I was I was such a mess, but, you know, plus I was driving back and forth, and I could barely sleep, and so, you know, how I was going to keep that up for that, you know, for, for much longer. But the day came when I cried out to him in the car, and I said, God, what is wrong with me? So everything in me cried out to, to God at that point, like everything in me. So I knew that he had heard me. Because, I mean, I had I had a relationship with him before, and I, of course, I... You know, I guess I thought I still had, but I was seeing him in a much different light through, again, just being under legalism. And so because I knew that he heard me that night, I was able to fall asleep. And so when I, I fell asleep and the Lord gave me two dreams, and so God is so good. And I just want to say here right there that, you know, you know, people of God, when you go, and anybody in the world, when you go through something, God is willing and able to hear you and to answer your cry, and He's able to deliver you and to counsel you back to wholeness. And so that day I cried out to Him, and so He gave me two dreams. And like I said earlier, God does not mince His words, like, because it's the truth that will make us free. That's what the Bible says. And so Jesus loves us too much not to speak the truth to us. He's going to speak the truth about our situation. And so in the dream, two dreams, the first dream the Lord showed me, that was really surprising to me at first. He showed me that witchcraft was my problem. <laughs> okay. So I said, witchcraft? How can witchcraft be my problem? <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to any occult practices or anything like that. How mm -hmm. can it be my problem? Nevertheless, he showed me that witchcraft was my problem. And he showed me that this sort of witchcraft appears very inoffensive, very harmless. It looks a cute little thing that nothing should be worried about. You know. But yet we're talking about witchcraft. And then he showed me that I was, and I, he showed me that I was in my earthly father's apartment. So it's like he was showing me I was in my father's house. Okay. So even though all of this was happening, I was in my father's house. So you know that's what you know when you religious people, you can be going to church, you may be going to the father's house, but what's going on on the inside? And then after that, he showed me that I, and he showed me that the witchcraft started small, but it grew until it infected my entire life. And so again, I talked about earlier about not giving the devil a foothold, but that's what I had done. Then he showed me that I was working hard, but that my working was in vain because it was not doing a, it wasn't working a real change in me. If I was really working hard, I change myself, but it was not doing anything in me. It was not really changing me. And then he showed me act, uh, after that that I was uh, I had a form of godliness, but that I denied the power thereof from such 
turn away. There's a scripture in the Word of God that says, talks about such people. They have a form of godliness, but you know what? They deny the power of the finished work of the cross. From such, they truly turn away. So he showed that about me. <laughs> okay. And the second dream, he showed me by putting on of a facade to appear good be- before man. Mm-hmm. And the last thing he showed me was the father weeping because his daughter was gone. And so, lo and behold, my worst fear had come to pass. And so, but again, the Lord, of course, he had a purpose. First, you have to confront truth about yourself if you want to come to the place where you admit it, you repent, and then you can turn from it. But unless we confront what's going on with ourselves head on, then we cannot come to light and be forgiven and move on. And so God was revealing to me. But the point is, he showed me which craft was my problem. And I thought, so I woke up. I, you know, of course, I had the dreams, and I thought God really spoke to me. It's clear. <laughs> but why witchcraft? And so I came to my home office, and there was a little book sitting on my desk, uh, which is uh, written by Derek Prince, Lucifer Exposed, The Devil's Plan to Destroy Your Life. And so as I pondered about the dreams and the witchcraft part, I I took the book and I randomly opened it. And and when I opened it and I was asking, God, witchcraft, what do you mean? My eyes fell on the sentence that says, wherever we encounter legalism, somewhere behind it is witchcraft. Wow. And I mean, yes. So I, I mean, and so I said, what is legalism anyway? So, you know, like, I didn't know <laughs> what my problem was. And the thing is, I didn't know what legalism was. And so, you know, that's why the church needs to be aware of what legalism is, so that they, as a means of prevention, obviously, so sure. that they know. Right. And so just as a quick, why, what's the connection between witchcraft and legalism? So that's taken from Galatians chapter 3, verse 1, just so that the, the listeners can understand, though I don't understand the connection. Well, that's, that's uh, taken from, it, it, it's inspired from Galatians 3, 1, from the New King James Version, for example. It says, O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? And the Galatians church, this is where the Apostle Paul was dealing with them because of legalism. If you read that book, it's all about them now going back to things that they wanted to do, like uh, all kinds of things that they had to do to, per- to be perfected. Yeah. And you talked about that earlier, about being perfected, and, and that's, if you read that book, then it's, it's yeah, you start to find out strength. Let yeah. me jump in for a second, because that, that's been a powerful passage in my own life, especially Galatians 3.3, 3, just two verses later. Right. But think about it. Here's the Apostle Paul, like the Jew of all Jews. This, he was a Pharisee. He was, he lived according to the law, etc. But he has this radical encounter with Jesus where he's saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. And, and then some of the people that he's ministering to who also had been Jews, they were Jewish, but put their faith and trust in Christ, were wanting to go back to the law, and they were starting to ask questions like, well, can these people over here really be saved if they don't get circumcised? Well, that was a mm-hmm. Jewish procedure. And, and so they're beginning to flirt with this idea that if we just try to continue to, to live according to the law, well, then God will really think that we're spiffy and brand new and that we're, we're really great people because we're adding all of this to our salvation. And Paul rebukes him, and he goes, you're right. Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit? Will you now be perfected by the flesh? Like, you think that how you live is what's going to perfect you? No, I am what perfects you. You came to faith in in Christ by putting your trust in me and me alone. How are you going to be made righteous? By continuing to keep your faith and trust in me alone. Our righteousness is found in Christ. Kathleen, I know that you know that. So describe it from your own perspective, because at some point, God lifted the veil for me and allowed me to begin to really live in freedom and understand that, that what Jesus accomplished at Calvary was enough, that God was satisfied with me simply because of what Jesus did for me. Yeah, and, and yeah, the thing is, the fear of the legalist is that if they really fully are under the grace of God, will it not cause them to excuse sin? Mm-hmm. And that's the, tr- that, that's the fear that they have, and their answer is no. Because we need to understand what grace is all about. First of all, grace is the power of God to live holy. The Bible says in Romans 6.14 that we are no longer under the dominion of sin because we are not under the law but under grace. Your only hope of living a a victorious life from glory to glory is to be under the grace of God. The moment that you add law, the law, the Bible says, is the strength of sin. The law has no power to uh, to change your human nature. And so that's why for the legalists to fear that your only hope of ever living 
righteous in any degree it will be to be under the grace of God, under the law you can. Uh, but what happened with me, and, yeah, and actually we were talking about earlier in Galatians, uh, yeah, Galatians 3, 3, that's exactly it. The same way we were saved by grace through faith is the same way that we live by grace through faith. We cling to the grace of God. It, 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 see, when we, so when we come unto the grace of God, it's not that we start to, we're going to be just now be lost in the waves of temptation and sin. It's about the grace of God will keep us and teach us to say no to ungodliness, the Bible says in Titus. So it's to understand we came knowing that we need to be saved from our sins. Yeah. So we came <laughs> repenting. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I, I'm looking at the clock. Let's take a break, because when we come back, I want to delve into this a little bit deeper. You're, you're really uh, excited about this. And you're, drop, you're dropping truth bombs on us, Kathleen, <laughs> that we need to process for a second because I don't want any of this to slip by. The kind of stuff you're talking about is life-changing. And, and I don't want to just mention it and move along quickly. I want to dig in a bit. So let's, let's take a break. We'll be back with more of NBL in just a moment. The Law of Redemption is the name of the book from Kathleen Kazmarek. We'll tell you. By the way, can you get this on Amazon, Kathleen? Yes. Okay. You can. Um, K-A-C-Z-M-A-R-E-K, Kathleen Kazmarek. Kathleen, by the way, spelled with a K. Kathleen Kazmarek, The Law of Redemption. You can order it at Amazon uh, or uh, get a copy at a local Christian bookstore. NBL Today brought to you by Cornerstone Bookshop in North York, Ontario. And maybe you can call Cornerstone, see if they can get some copies reserved for you so you can go pick one up over there. Cornerstone Bookshop, not only are they open, but there's a sale on right now at Cornerstone. Okay, we're back at it here. Kathleen Kazmarek, our guest, and her book is called The Law of Redemption. It's not just a story about the gospel and about grace. It's literally the story of her life and what God has taught me in my life and in many of your lives as well. But let me just, uh, let me, you touched on a couple of scriptures. I want to go back for a second and dig in because let me just say that I, I came to faith in Christ as a young man, uh, put my trust in Jesus and in Jesus alone, and I knew that I couldn't save myself because I was fully aware of how broken and sinful I was. And so on that day, I trusted Jesus. But quickly, uh, you know, in the life of the church, began to be very concerned about what kind of music I listened to, uh, how I dressed, whether or not my hair was long or short. I mean, I'm, I'm old, so these issues used to matter, Kathleen, just so you know. <laughs> okay. But... Mm -hmm. You know, I wasn't allowed to drink, dance, swear, smoke, go to parties, whatever. And somebody might say, well, you shouldn't have been doing those things anyway. Okay, there's an argument to be made about how many of the things I'm describing could be destructive in your life. But the point is, it was a very external kind of walk with God. It was about man-made rules and regulations. Uh, the church I went to, we didn't lift our hands in worship because that was worldly. You know, it was, it was showy. Now, there were friends that I had that went to different churches where they did lift their hands in worship. But I mean, my point is there was this list, this maybe it was unwritten rules and regulations, but we certainly were trying to live by some of those rules and regulations. Well, Colossians 2:20 20 to 23 says, since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why, as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, which by the way, Sounded like my upbringing in a very legalistic setting. Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules, which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use, are based on merely human commands and teachings. Such regulations, indeed, have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body. But, ready for this? They lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. In other words, those rules can't stop you from sinning. They, they're of no value in the battle against sin. And then you referred to Titus 2, which I want to read in contrast. Titus 2.11 says, For the grace of God has appeared, grace being the unmerited favor of God, that same grace that saved me and you and all of us who know and love Jesus. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to everyone. It, meaning grace, instructs us, to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live sensible, upright, and godly lives in this present age. What? This isn't talking about rules and regulations. It's talking about living according to grace. And you referred to that earlier. It's why I wanted to stop and pause and give you a chance to dig in a bit there and help us understand what that 
really means because because you said there's a fear and I, I i agree 100 percent. people have a fear if i don't live by some set of rules and regulations well i might just go out and sin like like there's no tomorrow i might just go crazy sinning help us understand why that's not true according to the gospel yeah, no, because, again, the, the, the grace of God is the power of God to live holy, and it's a work that's done from the inside out. So we are led by the promptings of the Holy Spirit. So first of all, we are made, like, first of all, we're made righteous through, we receive Christ's righteousness as a free gift. And so that happens, so on the inside, our spirit is made perfect. The Bible says in Hebrews uh, 10, 14, that by one single offering, we have been perfected forever, who is made holy. And so we also refer to as trees of righteousness. And so there's that seed planted in us that as we water it with the Word, and as we spend time with the sun, you know, in prayer, then that seed grows and that tree of righteousness grows. But all the while, our faith in Christ is what makes us righteous, and it changes us from glory to glory. So someone who is under grace, the, the, that new nature doesn't want to sin anymore. We are hungry for righteousness. Someone who is hungry for righteousness is bound to make progress. And someone who is hungry for holiness is bound to change. You know, but but what it's a, it's, the, it's the root of the tree that matters to God is the heart. Is your heart the Lord? Is your heart trusting Him? See, it, it, do you want Him? Do you love Him? Because the righteousness goes deeper than what you do on the outside is what you want and what you love. And when you're on the grace, if you will stop serving God because you have to, you will realize that you want to. And that want to has a lot to do with that empowerment, see? And, and plus it purifies your motive so that your righteousness now can exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. <laughs> because of the righteousness of Christ in you. Mm-hmm. And so see, if, you, if we submit to that law, first of all, again, that law, the Bible says in Romans 7, 8, arouses sin. And so while people may, you know, whether you are a sinner, whether you're under the law, whether you're in the grace of God, you know what, no matter which way you are, you're going to fall short in your behavior, your outward performance from the glory of God. So it doesn't matter, at the end of the day, if you face truth, no matter where you are, you know, you, you need, you know, you're going to need to change, you need to grow. The difference, though, is what's happening on the inside. Mm-hmm. And so when you're under grace, though, so you have received the, 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 the righteousness of Christ, you're righteous there, and now that tree is good, because at the root, you're it's good if the righteousness of Christ is right. there, and then you can bear fruit. But if there is no tree of righteousness, you have nothing good there to bear real fruit. And so, 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 so again, if you understand the finished work of the cross, he, Jesus came to save us from our sins. He didn't, he didn't come to save us in our sins. So the big events don't have to fear if he understands what's the whole purpose of the whole thing. And then now, because the Christ righteousness is in me and empowers me and changes me from glory to glory, then, because it's from the inside out, then you know what? When Jesus said, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, there's no way you're going to make it in. Well, you know what? For Christ's righteousness in me, and it's bearing fruit from glory to glory. My righteousness, because of his righteousness, exceeds <laughs> now the righteousness of the religious folks. Right? Wow. So, so yeah. it, to see that, to, oh, go ahead. You want to say something? Go no, ahead. I'm just <laughs> so amazed by what you're saying, because it's so insightful. And I don't know how long it took you to grasp this kind of stuff. I'm just beginning to really grasp this stuff in its fullness and it's why i can't wait to finish reading your book but um these are deep spiritual truths because uh, kathleen you and i both know because we were there so many in the body of christ live on that surface level you know getting tossed to and fro by like well oh man i had a bad day yesterday god must not really love me and so i got to try harder today and the whole focus is me and my behavior and what i'm doing as opposed to resting in what jesus did for me those, it, and the it, grace of God will free you to be able to right. no longer look at yourself so much, but to look at others. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Yeah, uh, really, ultimately, the bottom line is, is freedom we're talking about. And by the, you know, one other thing, growing up in an environment where I wasn't allowed to do this, that, and the other thing, and virtually everything, I wasn't allowed to do anything, you know, any, anything that looked like fun or that other people were doing, that's the very thing I wanted to do. So it's like telling a six-year-old, you know, I'm going to leave the room now, but whatever you do, don't look inside that cookie jar. You are not allowed to, to ever go inside that cookie jar. Well, what, what's the six-year-old want to do? And, and that's the environment I grew up in. So my whole focus, uh, by the way, uh, I think it's in uh, Romans uh, 7, but you know, the, the, the law actually excites sin. It might, somewhere, I'm not sure, maybe Romans 2, but yeah. Yeah, it, yeah. okay, so um, that, what's that mean? 
that living according to a man-made set of rules and regulations, um, this legalism that we're talking about, living that way actually makes you want to sin more as opposed to mm-hmm. resting in grace. And, and Kathleen, you've experienced that personally. Yeah, and so that's why, like, uh, and you're right, like, even at the beginning when I was saying some people would never think of backsliding in sins. But you know what? They have backslidden in legalism, which makes sins all the more powerful. Yeah, wow. <laughs> so even that's for something. When you read Romans, uh, Romans chapter 7, the Apostle Paul says, the things that I want to do, I don't do. Mm-hmm. And the things that I don't do, I want to do. When I want to do something, evil is present within me. At that moment, it's describing somebody who sees the law, and he sees it's good, but he's trying without relying on the finish of the cross. And then in Romans 8, he comes and he says, oh, wow. Now that the Lord, he said, because then he says at the end of 7, oh, wretched men that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Because you see, in our flesh, there is a law of sin and death. That's the law. It's there. How are we going to just deal with it? Are we going to try harder? That's where the law comes in. That's where the, the, the sin is empowered. He's saying there's another way. Is the, is the law the spirit of life? He says, if we, in Galatians, it says, if you walk after the spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's, again, why we don't need to fear grace. On the contrary, that's our only hope. <laughs> because when yeah. we are led by the Spirit, then we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. But if we keep being told, you must not do this, you must not do that, and we don't understand the finish of the cross, the, the Bible says sin revives and we die, so to speak, because the law excites sin, like you said, and then sin revives all the more. It strengthens sin, and the law makes us conscious of sin, so that all we can focus on is sin. <laughs> wow. As opposed to being free from it, forgiven from it, and then be freed by the yeah. grace of God to live yeah, that victorious life. You have such a great perspective on that. All right, we're going to take a break. We'll be back again in just a moment. Kathleen Kazmarek, K-A-C-Z-M-A-R-E-K, is author of the book called The Law of Redemption. It's subtitled, What Must One Do to Go to Heaven? We'll be back with more of NBL here in just a moment. I want to thank you for listening, participating with us, and hanging with us during the conversation. We'll be back in just a moment. Our program today is brought to you by Crosslink Homes. If you're looking for quality home renovations in the Burlington, Toronto area, check out crosslinkhomes.ca. All right, we are back here. we got a couple of minutes left with Kathleen Kesmerick. The Law of Redemption is the name of the book. And really, the spotlight here is ultimately on Jesus. It's not on Kathleen or me or anything. It's, it's on what Christ accomplished for us at Calvary. Kathleen, take a second and walk us through anything else you want to say about the book, because obviously we've only just skimmed the surface. You also uh, do a lot of teaching. Uh, I don't know if you ever do seminars or anything like that, but if people are going to want to connect with you, I definitely want to give them an opportunity to do so. So help us understand that. But... Um, it, any other overview you want to give us about how you approach this issue in the book? Because obviously it's a couple of hundred pages and we've only skimmed the surface. Yeah. The only thing I would say as well is for any one of you who is struggling with, with law, please be encouraged that as you're listening to this, it's God revealing to you like, to, to rescue you from legalism and to his life. But what I want to say just as, I want, as we closing, like Neil said, is that when I, I said that the Lord revealed to me that legalism was our problem, I, I said... I panic all the more because I, I feared because now, now that I knew that legalism was my problem, I knew that God hated legalism, and I tried to come out the way I had come in. So I tried to come out in my own strength at first. But also when I cried out to him, I, I asked him, what must I do? That if I keep doing it and doing it and doing it, I will get better and better and better. Like I will start to feel better, or, you know, I'll be better, I'll feel better, I'll be better. And that night, the Lord is so powerful, because the first week when he revealed to me the gave him with my problem, he really stepped in in an amazing way, so I gave him so much praise for that. And at 5.30 in the morning, he woke me up with an audible voice, and he said, what must one do to go to heaven? And his voice began as a man's voice and quickly transformed into a child's voice. And so he was showing me my way out. And so the way out is to become like a little child again. And so as you're hearing this and you're wondering, okay, that's great, I'm trying to see it, but what do I do next? Well, of course you cry out to God. He's your, you know, you, you come to Him, you ask Him to help you, and then He's going to walk you through a journey where you're going to learn to become, to, to, to learn to become like a little child again. And that's, that's the essence of the disposition of, of the child of God, is to be like a little child again, innocent, trusting, you know, humble, carefree, it's just that little child, and so to have the faith of a little child. And so, yeah, that's probably what I would want to end with. Wow. And so, yeah, you're asking how they can... Uh, Connect uh, with you, yeah. Yeah, so uh, we have a website. So the website is www.paulandkathleenministries.org. So Paul is my husband. And so 
Paul and Kathleen Ministries dot org and it's all in one and, and in there you'll see the, the, the ministries that's happening there and, and yeah so you can okay. uh, see there yeah Paul and it's not the Apostle Paul it's a different Paul we're talking about I'm kidding uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah no <laughs> all right Paul yeah, yeah. Paul, oh, yeah. Paul and, and Kathleen Ministries dot org you said yeah and if they want to connect more um, like by email it would be Paul Kathleen Kaz at gmail dot com and Paul Kathleen Kaz all it all in one, the CAS will be spelled K A C Z or K A C Z. Yes. So Paul Kathleen CAS at gmail.com. Okay. Yeah. Or the website Paul and Kathleen Ministries.org. Well, I'm yeah. really grateful that you took time to be with us today. And I don't know, how long has the book officially been out? Hmm? How long has oh, the book the been book. available? Yeah, uh, five years. I published it in 2016. Oh, no kidding. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I only found out about it a few months ago, and when I saw it, I thought, right. I, I definitely want to do a conversation on this book. But if you want to get a copy, uh, definitely check it out at Amazon, The Law of Redemption from Kathleen Kesmerick. And so grateful for your time with us today, Kathleen. Uh, I'd love to catch up again some other time. If I said Slava Bogu, would you know what I meant? No. <laughs> okay. All right, because sometimes, you know, and people from, like, Ukraine or whatever, some places near Poland... Uh, anyway, I said God bless you in, uh, mm, in Slavic language. <laughs> How would you say it in Polish? I don't know. Actually, that's my married name. I don't speak Polish at all. <laughs> well, where are you from originally? Because you've got an accent. Quebec. I can... Yeah, I know. From Quebec. I'm a French Canadian. Oh, for, oh, no kidding. Well, yeah. I hope I hope I don't offend you when I say you don't sound French. <laughs> no, I, not at all. <laughs> well, how do you say it in French? Yeah. <laughs> how do you say God bless you in, in French then? Uh, okay. I made you prove. That, I made you prove that you can actually speak French. All right. Well, yeah. God bless you. Thanks for being with us on NBL, and we'll look forward to talking to you again sometime soon. Thank God you bless. so much. All right. We'll be back with more right after this. Don't go away. Today's program is brought to you, obviously, by each and every one of our advertising partners, including our friends at Atrial Toyota.